You just you couldn't let it be, could you? <laughs> uh, today's speaker is uh, Reza Hussein Yudon, and um, he combines a range of different things in his career, and as well as being a really interesting combination uh, with uh, within the industry applications of the work that he does in, within the clinic. And, uh, so he, he is the director of uh, the Digi Psych Lab and uh, the chief medical officer for uh, Neuralink Laboratories. And his, his background, he has uh, training both in engineering and uh, bachelor's in uh, electrical engineering, engineering and master's in biomedical engineering, as well as a, a medical engineering. Uh, he is uh, a sort of southern uh, broad uh, base, and I would do a lot of the interesting work that he does. He's now uh, transitioning from a, a residency in psychiatry here at UW to the uh, Neurology Movement Disorders Fellowship. Thank you, Ariel. It's nice to be introduced by someone uh, you have so much respect for in the work you do. This is very cool. Um, so today I'm going to kind of give an introduction because I so it's a newer field and I think it's probably new to most of you. But the the term you know digital biomarkers that's coined now, but really it's you probably heard of it in other forms, and so we'll touch on that a little bit. And thank you for eScience and you and for for hosting this. Happy to always kind of spread the word about the work we're doing. And often I feel like the medical school and the medical campus feel very separated from upper campus. But don't be intimidated by the bikers on Burke Gilman. You can cross that and come over. I know they go really fast. So I am, uh, you know, disclosures, I do have, I own stock in Neuralex. Um, right now that stock is worth pretty much nothing, but <laughs> so, someday. <laughs> Um, we're making a push. Uh, right now we're looking for our HQ1. So, you know, I know Am <laughs> everyone's been distracted with Amazon's HQ2, but we're not getting the same deal from Seattle Amazon did, so uh, if they're listening, we'll, we'll take anything. Um, so goals for today. Uh, I kind of want to use this time to give you not just an overview of the work we've done in, in my lab, and I you know, I'm taking a lot of liberty calling it a lab. I've done my best to put together, you know, students and faculty and, and really make a research agenda that is moving in this direction. But I want to define what a digital biomarker is. You know, what is the interest? Why? What's the point of it? What's wrong with, you know, MRI? What's wrong with blood tests? Um, is there anything wrong with them? Uh, I want to talk about voice as a biomarker because that's been my particular interest, although. I see utility across the range of possibilities, which we'll, we'll touch on a bit. And then, you know, touch on machine learning because now that's kind of ubiquitous. And, you know, as we get, you know, it's sort of like chicken or the egg. Is digital biomarkers, are they possible because of machine learning or is it, you know, other way around? And then I'll touch on some of the data sets we've worked on and some of the papers we've published across these different disease areas. Today I'll focus on schizophrenia, depression, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. And then we'll talk about, you know, kind of what we're working on now. And then the hugs are optional. My wife made me write the optional next to the hugs. So 
What is a digital biomarker? Uh, there's actually a new journal out as of last year called Digital Biomarker. It's by Carter Publishing. And Ray Dorsey, who's a fellow ne movement disorder neurologist, uh, senior guy at University of Rochester, runs his own center there. He actually started the journal. So it's an academic-based journal. Um, and this is how they define digital biomarker. So this is probably resonate with a lot of you. I mean, I bet half of you are wearing a wearable right now um, to some degree. Actually, I don't know how many people are wearing a wearable. I'm curious what the, pretty good. Some good, some good uh, frequency there. So they define it as objective, quantifiable, physiological, and behavioral data that are collected and measured by means of digital devices such as portables, wearables, implantables, or digestibles. And are you guys familiar with di some of the digestibles out there? It's things like, you know, we use Digest sometimes to take pictures of your intestinal tract, or now the newest version of Abilify, which is an antipsychotic, actually has some microchips uh, in it that you swallow right. They thought it would be a good idea to market to psychotic patients, apparently, swallowing a microchip. Um, I'm very curious about that. And then the data is typically collected, you know, it's typically used to explain, influence, or predict health-related outcomes. Digital biomarkers also represent an opportunity to capture clinically meaningful objective data. Does it all make sense to everyone? Okay. And so touching on why, well, I'm motivated to be as non-invasive as possible, provide something that's cheap, accessible. I think of how hard it is to reach patients. Being at UW, we're particularly focused on how do we reach people in the you know, middle of nowhere in Montana. You know, we're responsible for them. So as a fellow right now, I'm actually I'm credentialed in all five states of the Northwest because we take care you know, of Medicare and Medicaid patients from all five states. Um, and so I'm thinking, how do I get to them? A lot of times, they're not going to come in. You know, are they going to fly or for, you know, for a visit, for a 30-minute visit with me? Does it make sense to ask them to do that? So uh, I, want, I want a biomarker that's representative of the individual, but also the disease process. Um, recent advances in non-medical applications make a lot of this possible. And then I put questions mark, question marks next to specificity and sensitivity because that's really you know, what we're trying to develop here. So bringing up the example of voice, personally I'm fascinated by voice just because it's such a complex task, right? Something we take for granted just automatically. But think about how many muscles and what kind of coordination, precision coordination is taken to actually provide voice or create voice. That's why I'm, I'm so interested. This table, don't worry too much, but it was just meant to overwhelm you and make it seem cool. There's a lot of stuff going on. So clinical approach, just when I was trained in medical school, right, we learn about the various parts of the human body, you know, where voice comes from. And at the bottom, you can see it says primary speech disorders associated with neurologic disease. So we learn some of the basics. You know, if you have a stroke, depending on the location of the stroke, you might have different types of aphasia, trouble finding the right word, trouble maybe creating the right sounds. You know, your tongue doesn't work right anymore, the muscles don't work. But then I realized, you know, when, when I was deciding which direction to go with, with the digital biomarkers, you know, so much information is encoded in, in speech. And so we can go be much, much more specific than clinically if someone comes in with a stroke and they say, oh yeah, they have, you know, receptive aphasia, um, which is helpful clinically for sure in that moment, but I can be much more specific. And so the definition I kind of thought through with voice as a biomarker is any use of technology using automatic speech recognition to take a recording of your voice as an input and provide features consistent with any illness as an output. <clears throat> and so the example I bring up is, you know, how many times has, have, has anyone in this room, you know, had trouble interpreting a text message or sending a text message with the right meaning, right? Because as soon as you take out voice, you lose meaning. So there's, again, there's so much meaning there. And so you know what I mean, right? So everyone's had an awkward moment on text message? I've had many. Um, too many. Um, so that's the point. It's how do I capture that information digitally? So this is, and you know, voice is a, it's a big field, right? It's just getting started. Sure, there's been a lot of uh, improvements in kind of automatic rec uh, speech recognition, transcription technology, but use as a biomarker, that is, I think, still, you know, it's a very long-term goal, but that's certainly what we're trying to do. Um, but that's part of the attraction uh, for this field is it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of work. So one example I give here, uh, 
and I'll go over some Parkinson's data later, is this is a very typical clinical scenario where a patient comes in, uh, they've been taking their Parkinson's medications, I'm seeing them for follow-up, and <clears throat> often you can hear the changes in their voice, so it's not that it's undetectable by the human ear. You know, on the contrary, often you will hear, oh, okay, you can tell you're not on your medication, your Parkinson's is pretty bad. And so they might be speaking slower, fewer words per minute. You know, think about Parkinson's. When you're losing your dopamine, just think about everything kind of slows down. You get rigid. You have a hard time taking a big breath. Um, and so the patient might tell you he's having times in between doses. He's wearing off. You know, his dosing wears off at 3 or 4 o'clock. And so can we capture that? Can I capture that at home? Can I capture that, you know, in the clinic without just relying on my you know, my personal subjective kind of, um, opinion. So just kind of warming up, touching on extracting voice features, right? So on this slide, I'm just showing, you know, raw audio data, relatively easy to interpret. I mean, it's a little more intuitive, right? Just time domain, time axis, is, you know, as the x-axis, and you kind of see amplitude, and, you know, you take a sample of human voice. What we do is we might take some time series data, but we also do some frequency transformation. So we might do a Fourier transform and get some frequency domain data. And from here, we're going to extract features that are acoustic in nature and based on you know, the spectra, spectrogram. So pitch, jitter, energy shimmer, these are all and MFCCs, which I'm happy to go into more detail later, all represent very interesting. Is that a question? So it's a mel, mel capsule frequency coefficient. And so the Mel frequency uh, range, are people familiar with this? Music people kind of have heard of this, the Mel scale. So it's basically uh, translates uh, the frequency spectrum of a signal onto something that's been adjusted that the human ear understands. And interestingly, I actually heard uh, a senior um, researcher, uh, Satra Ghosh, I think is the best person I've ever heard explain what an MFCC is in terms of what it is that you're listening to. But it's a five, six step process to extract this feature. So it's a lot of math involved. But at the end of the day, it's capturing a combination of your, your basically your sound, your frequency, and your, 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 the power you're putting into your voice. And it's shaped by your vocal tract. So it, it can be sort of unique to the person and unique to the disease. So there's a lot of information. MFCCs are actually what has allowed voice technology like the, you know, the Alexa at home to be so accurate. They rely heavily on MFCCs. That's allowed them to become very accurate um, in you know, other speech technology. But it's a good question. It's, you know, it's funny. It's something we borrowed from uh, non-medical applications, but it's turned out to be very helpful. And over here, I'm just listing. So these are frequency domain features, and these are linguistic features. And so I'm just mentioning. In, with linguistics, you can kind of drive yourself crazy because you can. there's infinite number of features, right? I can say, like, well, simple things like noun frequency or verb frequency, but then you can make all kinds of ratios, right? Like, what's noun to pronoun? So, for example, what might you guys think is an issue in Alzheimer's? What would you think would happen to the amount of pronoun use? What do you think people do in Alzheimer's? Someone yell it out. Do you use more pronouns or less pronouns? You stop using people's names, right, in specific. So you start saying, like, more of he, she, that thing. So these become very important. So uh, prosodic feature, so response and silence ratio tends to be important, certain diseases, right? And so these are just kind of touching on, you can see this is just a small sample, but there's obviously thousands of features you can extract. So is machine learning a requirement for digital biomarker use? Well, you know, I think most of us would argue yes. Because the point I'm trying to make is we end up with thousands of features. How am I going to interpret that within my human brain? Maybe some people can, but I certainly can't. And so the thought is, well, now I have so many features. I need to do some, some kind of clever data science and math to figure out, well, what are the important features? Do some feature reduction techniques. And then also feed those features into models. And that takes some computational power. So. I think machine learning in combination with recognition, like the, the wearables and the tech, the hardware we have to capture this data, together makes this sort of digital biomarker feel possible. So again, here in some of the work I'm going to show, you'll see we do some steps to reduce number of features, 
And you might actually see that you can increase accuracy by reducing number of features because more isn't always better. Um, and also reducing file size, just practical things that make it a little bit more, more possible. <clears throat> so overall in our work, part of it has been to build up a pipeline that's applicable for anybody anywhere. So regardless of what data you have, whether it's imaging or voice or whatever, the general pipeline, we want to be able to do some transformations, come up with, you know, feed it into a model, take those features, feed it into a model, you know, and then try to take new data or new samples and fit it to that model and see, you know, can we end up with this value we're interested in? So can I predict my depression score? Can I predict my Parkinson's diagnosis or symptom? Um, I was just talking with, uh, about this with Anisha the other day. I don't think she's here. I told her not to come. Um, but we were talking about this anecdote that maybe some of you have heard of, but it's a machine learning paper that came out, I think it came out in 2005 or 2006, and it caused uh, lots of, a lot of waves in the field because it was this really amazing breakthrough. So it was kind of at the beginning of this deep learning application in healthcare. And this hospital had taken their electronic healthcare record data and they showed that they could train a model, and they did deep learning, so it was a black box. It was, we didn't know what, what the model was learning on. And they took uh, data about people being admitted to the hospital with pneumonia. And the, the model was able to predict who was going to have a bad outcome and who was going to have a good outcome. And it was a big breakthrough. It was like, wow, this, this machine learning algorithm, this deep learning algorithm can predict who's going to have a bad outcome with the pneumonia, right? So awesome like you can see I mean this was the curve here so pretty good I mean you know like above a 0.9 true positive rate yeah I mean in, in, in medicine too false positives definitely can be harmful but with pneumonia it's like eh, I'd rather have some false positives right so this was considered amazing but then they they kind of did some monitoring and they saw that the algorithm was telling people with asthma that came to the emergency room with a concern for pneumonia that they could go home safely and be treated at home and so people started thinking, well, why is it telling people with asthma? Wouldn't that make it you know, worse? So what they discovered was, and this comes into the intelligibility of machine learning in healthcare and why you have to be very careful, the hospital had an internal algorithm that if you had asthma, you never went to the emergency room, you got fast-tracked to the ICU. So the machine learning algorithm learned that those people did better because they were at the ICU, they got better care. Does that make sense? So it was, it was picking up on something that was very real, but it was making the wrong conclusion. So had we started triaging people in the emergency room and say, oh, you have asthma, okay, go home, right? It would have been a disaster. So anyways, after this paper came out, you know, that all came to light. And it was a very, it was a very important lesson. Nobody got hurt. I mean, it was uh, kind of a test case. But just to point out, with healthcare and using machine learning, generally my approach is I, always, I never believe the result, you know, initially, especially if it's a good result. And you'll see. I'm going to show you an example. It, it happened with our Parkinson's data. So <clears throat> I'm going to go over these few examples. Okay, so we'll start with schizophrenia. This one I'm going to uh, point out work of a colleague at IBM Research. Um, this is Guillermo Secchi. He's, I would consider, one of the absolute top leaders in the field. He's been doing computational psychiatry at IBM Research for 20 years now, and he runs a, a pretty good-sized research group there with a completely independent uh, kind of mission of you know, doing academic kind of research. And so he teamed up with Columbia, it was Columbia uh, in New York, and they followed, they were asking, like, can we use voice to predict schizophrenia onset? And so what they did was they took 35 high-risk adolescents before any disease onset, but high-risk means you know the family member has schizophrenia. They had some reason to believe that some of them would eventually probably develop schizophrenia. They took their voice recordings, so they did a bunch of language modeling, and they came up with a few features from the language. They narrowed it down to three features. And building just a basic convex hull with these three features, and I'll, I'll explain those in a second, they were able to then follow those patients for a few years, and they were able to predict, you can see the five red dots are the five patients that ended up having schizophrenia. So the model, with a small sample size, had 100% had accuracy, but it was able to, to predict who those five were. But what was more interesting is not so much, you know, I'm not jumping up and down, it's a small sample size about the, about the accuracy, but I think it was pretty clever using the language features they did. Maximum phrase length turned out to be very sensitive. And this is, 
as you can imagine, if you're becoming psychotic, what happens to your phrase length? It probably gets smaller. Uh, you kind of speak in, in shorter bursts. Determiners, so that, watch, what, whichever, whatever, you use a, more of those. <clears throat> So less specific. So some of these are actually probably overlap with dementia and other things, right? So it's not super specific. But here's, I think, something that becomes pretty specific for uh, schizophrenia. Minimum semantic coherence. This is a big field in itself, uh, semantic coherence. Um, and that was a kind of a clever feature where they actually assigned numerical values to the words in the document of what they were transcribing, what the patient said. And they showed that even in teenage years before schizophrenia onset, their words started to loosen up. So meaning they were a little less related to each other than they should have been. So compared to like a whole bunch of normal language and text that they trained on, their words were not as closely related. Because when you become psychotic, you start potentially saying things that are completely unrelated. Does that make sense? So those three, and since then actually, this is the first paper, two years later, so just last year, they published, they, did, they replicated this at UCLA with a larger cohort, and they got also very good results. I think they did it closer to 100 people. So it's really cool work. And you know, for us, the challenge has been, I, we have ongoing data collection. Uh, one of our partners is schizophrenia.com. That's the largest online you know, sort of community I could find with schizophrenia or psychosis. And they're posting our app, web app to collect voice samples. But as you can imagine, I've done some testing with them and some sort of uh, small group testing just to see what the feedback would be. And, as you could anticipate, <clears throat> um, Rachel, do you have your charger? I think it's going to die. No, it's OK. I just got the little message. So as you can imagine, people are very paranoid, for example. They're not going to want to give you your voice samples. So I have to figure, it's a, it's a, it's a formidable challenge. I got to figure out how to help these patients feel, or just people feel comfortable um, providing the voice samples. So. So anyways, we're actively collecting voice. Thank you. And we'll hopefully have more to report on that in the future. But I'm very interested in psychosis, just because cognitively, as a psychiatrist, but now also in neurology, I'm very interested in the overlap of psychosis with other cognitive issues like dementia, those kinds of things. <clears throat> uh, I want to touch on depression. So we collected. We've been collecting uh, depression samples. We did some data collection here with some undergraduates who helped us in clinics at UW and UW campuses. And then we also, I wanted to expand our data set because often a lot of these papers are you know, small sample sizes, 20, 30 people. I, I really wanted to see how much more we could get. So we posted a web app here, which you guys can check out just to see if you want. <coughs> and you're welcome to submit your voice sample because then I could have some more normals, which would be nice. Um, as we actually, have had a little uh, trouble. I mean, we we need more data on the extreme ends. Um, but yeah, Mental Health America is a you might, some of you might know, but it's a nonprofit advocacy group for mental health, and they're the website I found with the highest traffic. So if you type in, you know, I'm feeling depressed, and you want to take up a depression questionnaire, uh, most people end up at their website. So their questionnaire is completed on the order of tens of thousands of times a month. So sometimes 40, 50,000 times a month. So it's gets in impressive uh, traffic. At the end of the questionnaire now, they, they have one of our little boxes that says, hey, submit a voice sample for research. <clears throat> so with the first few hundred samples, I have to check to see where we're, but you know, we have this kind of constant stream of samples coming in. But we just have done some preliminary work. So we did our you know test uh, split, training test split. Um, we're training on depression score of this, so the, the questionnaire is called the PH, it's a patient health questionnaire, eight or nine. With, with research, it's often eight instead of nine because the ninth question is asking about suicidality. And I'm only laughing because it's a silly way to get around it, but research review boards are basically asking like, well, what if someone says they're suicidal, what are you gonna do? So then the solution was, well, we just won't ask. So in healthcare, you have to think about these things, but oftentimes that's unfortunately the solution. I'm more of a fan of getting that information and actually, you know, learning more about it. Um, so, anyways, that's a, another system issue for another time. So we have this score. We have the voice sample. <clears throat> We're doing some featureization. Um, we do some a combination of some open source toolkits, and we sort of made a, a part programmed a few of our own features. But just to quickly mention, you know, GMAPS is 
uh, 60, 90 features that come out of a Geneva con convention for, so a bunch of experts got together and said, oh, these are important for voice analysis. AVAC, have you guys heard of AVAC, Audiovisual Motion Challenge? It's been going for a long time. It's an international thing. It would just, I think it's happening this month, actually. I can't remember where it is this year. But they do really cool stuff, and so they have, they invite people to submit papers. It's a conference, but they also do a challenge. <clears throat> and out of that challenge, they'll often make their results open source, or they'll you know, provide their code if they came up with some. And so 2013, they came up actually with a pretty cool feature set. So it's, but you can see it's tw almost 2,300 features. So we, we grabbed those two, and there's some overlap, but mainly acoustic features. And so we do some cleaning potentially. With depression, you can imagine, I don't want to remove silences, for example, right? Those are important. So I don't have to do a ton of cleaning, depending on the data set, but sometimes there's some noise, sometimes there's background noise. Uh, it, it's a tough problem, it continues to be a challenge. <clears throat> so we, we extract the features, we do some either normalization or regularization. Um, we then train the models, and I'll show you the results of a few different models. And then we see, you know, in this example, can we predict depression scores? And so some preliminary results, some initial results. Just you know, a few outputs uh, of different models. On the pictures, in case you can't see, the orange lines are the real scores, and the blue lines are the predicted scores. And you can see we, we kind of, the first bit of data, we ended up with a lot of PHQ-9 scores sort of in the middle. So our, I think our accuracy was actually better with moderate depression. But with the extremes, like severe depression or, or not depressed at all, it was having a harder time picking up. You can see it has a harder time, excuse me, reaching the extremes. You know, the RMSC's, you know, okay for this initial batch. Interestingly, for the data we collected at UW, it did a lot better because I think that, that data we collected ourselves was much cleaner. It, I think it was more robust. We asked more questions. Um, so we, ha we had a little bit um, more data to go off of. And in that case, we were getting RMSC around 18 to 20. And, you know, that's approaching what's been published. I mean, the best kind of RMSC that's been published, at least for, um, for predicting this depression score. And we're approaching, just to translate that into an understandable number, you know, if the PHQ-9 is nine, let's say nine questions, and the max score is zero to 27. So an RMSC of, you know, like 11 to 15 means we're down to about one severity level accuracy. So pretty good, right? You might be one off. And so we're hoping to improve on that as we, we, as we grow more data. This is the slide, um, the poster of the undergraduates who helped, a bunch, uh, not all of them, but many of them, and then a few of the master's students from the iSchool helped them put it together. Uh, but this was some results from the research data. So I just showed you data that we collected online. This is data we collected in person. <coughs> for this kind of work? That's a good question. You know, a lot of the papers I've looked at use various metrics. You know, I, I don't even, wouldn't feel comfortable even quoting a specific number because I've seen kind of, I haven't seen, a, I guess, a consistent benchmark. But it's a good question. No, I mean, part of it is, I mean, s loosely based on previous work, but also, I mean, we could, we, we could definitely do more. I mean, it's just kind of a, a brief sample, yeah. It's certainly not complete. <clears throat> so uh, I'm happy to share this with people later. I'm not, it wasn't meant for you to read it necessarily, but I just wanted to throw up. Um, we did get some better, better results with the data we collected in person, so it makes me think, you know, quality obviously is coming into play here. And here we actually, we had collected a few different disease types, but there's Parkinson's and depression. Parkinson's is red, depression's blue. The green is actually borderline personality disorder because uh, the undergraduate who was collecting uh, from those patients was incredibly impressive. I mean, he, he just made, he, he managed to just get a really good data set from uh, these patients. And so those were the three we ended up presenting. And I'm happy to share this later. I'm just gonna keep moving along in the interest of time. Um, so anyways, future work for depression, 
you know, we do have access to actually Turkish and uh, German data sets. We're thinking about, can we merge some of those? Can we see if there's some consistent features? There is some preliminary evidence that shows, right, depression is very, you know, has similar features across cultures and languages. So I think that's important work. Um, we're trying to grow this data set. Of course, right now it's been unfunded, so I mean, you don't get any reimbursement for submitting a voice sample. I don't even know if that would help, honestly, but I'm trying to think of ways to get more data. Um, so I'll, let's move on to Parkinson's. <clears throat> so the third area I wanted to touch on was Parkinson's. This is probably the area we've done the most work on just because we had the most robust data set. Um, and our people and I gotta be careful not to you know, assume with, you know, I'm used to talking to neurologists, but does, does everyone know what Parkinson's disease is? It's, it's among the, I think it's the second actually most common neurodegenerative disease next to Alzheimer's now. So it's pretty common. I work at the VA too, so I see a lot of um, Vietnam era vets at this point. And there's a strong correlation because Agent Orange exposure seems to be directly tied to Parkinson's. It seems to have killed that specific part of the brain that causes Parkinson's. So these are reasons I, I like studying Parkinson's, uh, aside from the, the human component. It's a, it's a really nice disease to characterize because you see on symptoms and off symptoms, meaning if they haven't taken their medication or if they have the disease without treatment, it's very obvious. And then you can give them a medication and 30 minutes later they might look normal. And there's not very many diseases you can say that about, right? Like if I give you your anti antidepressant, I mean, can, could you know, if you put them in front of me in a week, I can't tell you if they're on it or not. So <clears throat> for a lot of reasons, it's really nice to capture data about Parkinson's. Other motivation is right now, it's very, again, it's very subjective. People come in and for the initial assessment, it takes an hour or two, I mean, it's, it's a long assessment. You know, I'm doing a lot of moving your arms, finger tapping, bradykinesia scores, rigidity scores, tremor scores, and I'm trying to quantify well, how bad are your symptoms. So part of the issue is, can I help streamline this? Can we get a digital biomarker for any of this? <clears throat> can people check on their symptoms at home? Right now, someone might not be taking enough medication or taking too much medication, but they have to wait till their appointment, it's a long process, so there's a lot of motivation here. And there's plenty of previous work characterizing speech, voice, and other, obviously the physical disorders, but voice disorders in particular with Parkinson's. And so if you send a Parkinson's patient to a speech and hearing science person or specialist, um, a speech and swallow specialist, they can characterize pretty well. I mean, they're, they're more trained, so they can really, on a number of di different dimensions, describe, oh, here, these are the deficits this Parkinson's patient has. And so, <clears throat> again, think about Parkinson's slowing down, you're losing dopamine, you're not moving as well. What, what would happen to your voice? So we wanted to use machine learning tools, right? Take some of the features of the voice we talked about, same model, and see and answer a few different questions we had. And we wanted to go beyond, you know, this whole you know, classification is interesting, like, oh, can we predict this person has Parkinson's or not? But really, I'm trying to think practically as a clinician too, how can I help patients? Right now, is it gonna be helpful to tell them that, no, it's like they already know they have Parkinson's and we're nowhere near being able to go out and say, you have, you're gonna have Parkinson's in 10 years. So what's gonna be helpful? I wanna answer questions like, can I help you adjust your medications, things like that. <clears throat> so Sage Bionetworks, are you guys familiar with Sage? Awesome, awesome uh, organization, nonprofit in Seattle, very dedicated to open science. And one of their first studies they launched on the App Store was an app for Parkinson's. And really impressive uptake, I think, in the first six weeks, they had up, up, upwards of 10,000 downloads. And they had lots of normals, they had a few thousand Parkinson's patients submit data. And these were the tasks they asked them to do, so screenshots from the app. So spatial memory, tapping tests. So I was talking about bradykinesia, right? Like how, how refined are your movements? That Parkinson's affects that. Cognitive effects of Parkinson's. <clears throat> Voice, which is wonderful, they collected that. And then gait and balance, which tends to be, right, the biggest signal. People with Parkinson's, you know, having trouble walking, being rigid, you know, the, the classic stooped posture with the shuffling gait, no arm swing. So they collected this data. It was open source, uh, open meaning we could apply and go through the steps and get access to it. And so we were able to do that. Uh, they also collected things like demographics. The UPDRS is a unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. So that's what is the standard clinical model that is international that everyone uses. So that's what I was talking about, the scoring of different things when you're, when you're doing an exam. 
<coughs> than the Parkinson's disease, or sorry, patient disease questionnaire. So this is another, it kind of touches on, um, I think it has, a, it does have a depression question in there, but it's kind of asking general questions. So anyways, this is a quick rundown of what was submitted, demographics, the UPDRS scores, and the, for this part, obviously, since the clinician's not seeing them, they're at home, they're just filling out the, the part that's the patient part. So it's <clears throat> their self-report of, of symptoms. PDQ8, then the memory activity. So these are activities, right? But check out the voice. They got 65,000 samples across 5,800 people. So you can kind of think about what issue, data science issue that might introduce, and we'll touch on that in a bit. And then the walking activity as well. So just something important to pay attention to. You know, they launched this, I believe it was, in two, it was either 2014 or 15 they launched it, but you can see <clears throat> they saturated the number of people pretty well, right? There was no reimbursement. This was just like a, hey, help us out, you know, download and give us some data. And you can see the dark area is the number of participants, the light gray is the number of tasks. So you can see, I mean, the, the number of participants saturated, but the number of tasks kind of grew pretty quickly at first, right? That's going to impact our data. And then here's controls and then Parkinson's. And you can see days on app, right? Big spikes early on. Again, but this is an app. It's not providing sort of anything in return, so it's hard to keep people engaged, right? It's not like a therapy app or something that you're getting. You're not getting money or anything like that. <clears throat> you can see it kind of drops out. But check it out. Some people stayed involved way far down, which is fascinating, right? So some people are really good about giving a ton of data. So we, we extracted audio features. Some of these were a little more intuitive, some less intuitive. Here are those famous MFCCs. <clears throat> uh, energy, entropy of energy. So various characteristics about the voice quality. And then here was our first question. We wanted to know, can I detect the presence of Parkinson's from the accelerometer data? So the iPhone in the pocket, taking 20 steps, can I, can I get that? The nice thing was they released this app in concert with Apple Research Toolkit. That gave us access to raw data. Any other app, if you're on the App Store, just through regular channels, you can't access raw data, meaning you might get permission to know like a geolocation of someone, but you can't have their accelerometer data. I mean, you know, I'm not sure if people are aware of this. So Apple Research Toolkit was actually helped, was made in large part with encouragement by Sage because they're saying, People are using iPhones, and it would be really helpful medically to be able to have this raw data. So these, this is the raw data we were able to get for the first time ever. Apple released raw data about people uh, from their iPhones. We know with their permission. And so these are the various ways of capturing their motion. So they have a gyroscope with six degrees, right? So there's raw data from that. <clears throat> and turns out over here, we, we did a plot. And the first thing we noticed was People without Parkinson's on the top, people with Parkinson's on the bottom. Just visually, you can see there's a difference, right? So we thought, interesting, there seems to be signal. There also, there seems to be signal more at the extremes, at the, at the kind of low frequencies and at the higher frequencies with people with Parkinson's. And so we thought, well, why don't we look at the kurtosis or the skew of the graph and see if we can use that as a feature to actually model and detect Parkinson's. Notably, <clears throat> does this make sense clinically? Because again, we get back to, remember the anecdote about getting in trouble clinically with machine learning? So I, I want to know, like, okay, does this, does this make sense? <clears throat> it does because if I'm somebody, if I'm, you know, a normal person is using a tighter band of frequencies to compute a, complete a movement, right? It's nice and refined. But if I have Parkinson's, all of a sudden I might, you know, have a lot of issues and be imprecise. So the frequency band, to me, makes sense. It's wider because they're going to be more imprecise using different frequencies, OK? So here is <clears throat> just a little artificial neural network topology map there. Here's our results from the movement data. So we had pretty good results. Um, is identity confounding, which I'm going to bring up a little later, uh, you know, I'm wondering, is that, is that playing a role here? But <clears throat> regardless, I mean, it's within the realm of reason that you know, for movement data, you can detect Parkinson's. So those are just some of our results. And so we were interested in a few other questions, too. I wanted to know, can I detect if someone's on their medications or not? <clears throat> I 
And so this one, this first question was kind of a basic, let's get it out of the way of, hey, can I detect Parkinson's in general? And then we moved on to, into medication detection, mood detection, <clears throat> and so on. I think those were the, and then severity detection We did the, was the other question we wanted to know. And that was in order to find out, can we detect Parkinson's actually earlier? So we, we stratified by disease severity. So we did some initial work, just basic initial work on taking voice and seeing can we actually just with voice, so instead of just with motion with the iPhone sensor in the pocket with your voice sample <clears throat> from the iPhone microphone, can we detect Parkinson's? And these were the results we got. Again, keep these in mind because we're gonna, I'm going to touch on some of the concerns about what might be elevating some of these results. <clears throat> so then we were curious. There was a question about mood and then severity of mood. So I was curious, can we detect depression in Parkinson's? So the, the thing to note here is the colors are people's uh, depression sort of severity. So people answered the green, they answered, oh, I, I'm never depressed. The yellow answered, oh, I'm occasionally depressed. Orange is sometimes depressed, and red is often depressed. And here is, is in a 3D view. So you can see with Parkinson's disease severity, people with lower disease severity were more likely to say that they're never depressed, right? <clears throat> and, and obviously there's more patients in this group. People with a little bit more moderate, a little higher PD, PD severity, it's kind of nice, it staggers nicely are uh, sometimes depressed or occasionally depressed, and then people with higher sometimes. And then interestingly, you know, the very depressed or often depressed span, they're sort of all over the place here, maybe sort of in the middle. But does that make sense to people? Is that clinically, does that clinically correlate? Why would, why would someone with really bad Parkinson's not be depressed? Or be, you know, why doesn't it stagger nicely like the others? What happens later in Parkinson's? You become, Parkinson's, you eventually become demented, right? And so as you become, as it be affects your brain and your cognition, this is what we see in Alzheimer's too. You know, the depression scores may go down. May not be 100% accurate, right? I mean, but it's, it's really hard to get in someone's head if, if once a neurodegenerative disorder is really taken over. So anyways, to me, th this wasn't necessarily a surprise. Uh, but again, you have to clinically correlate that because at the end stages of the disease, it, it's, it's devastating. And so here, um, we just wanted, I just wanted to point out here, Parkinson's disease severity um, in, of depressed people in red, and then disease severity in green of, of non-depressed. The point was, can we use depression and can we, can we separate with severity? So is severe, Parkinson's disease severity predictive of depression level and vice versa? So I kind of wanted to learn more about Parkinson's that way. So that's, that's a good point too. I think that's a controlling factor too is that, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, when we're doing these studies, often we're working with the caregivers. So, so in in-person studies, at least, we will get really severe symptoms, but that's because someone else is doing it for us. <clears throat> Meaning they're like, putting, but you're right, when, when Parkinson's gets at severe enough, it seems pretty hard to get a voice sample from someone. So you're absolutely right. And especially, can you imagine someone with a severe disease sustaining ah uh, for 10 seconds? That's what the voice samples was. I probably should have mentioned that. So it's, it's pretty hard, so you're, you're right. So I think that's also why we just have so little data at that point. And then the severity, you know, this is limited data too because it was really just one question. It's like, are you depressed? And then how badly? So it's really uh, subjective. Right. That's, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. That's definitely a confounder there. And that's, in a way, also the, the research sometimes in some ways can be easier with this population because of the caregiver. We'll override that. But you're right, when it comes to the, when I'm trying to study depression, it's a huge issue. Hey, can you come in, you know, and do all these things for me? 
Did you have a question too? No. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so anyways, these are just preliminary results. We haven't finalized these yet. Actually, some of the students are working on uh, just rerunning some of the data, um, taking into consideration a few things I'm going to mention in just a moment. And then I want to get moving just so to expose you guys to and tell you about the Alzheimer's disease uh, data as well. So another question, which I think is one of the more promising things, is can I help somebody manage their medications? Like just suggest a little more, a little less, because it's a low risk for Parkinson's to adjust medications in general. And then the idea was, you know, you'd think you'd be able to detect um, medication status and voice because, again, like clinically, it's a huge difference. But so, you know, initially we just, we were not getting great results. You can see our initial results were pretty much close to chance. And that kind of, that surprised me. And that's something I've been kind of scratching my head about. And we're still looking at this a bit. But there are limitations to the data set, so that in itself is a problem. One thing we were thinking about doing was, doing some image recognition, image classification with the spectrograms of the data and seeing if, if we get different results. That was one of the ideas, <clears throat> but we have not uh, done this yet. And then here are the medication classification results. So again, you can see the ROC curve is terrible. Um, but interestingly, right, if you take the average, you see the groups, the blue line is right before medication administration, meaning the person gave their sample right before they took their meds. So theoretically, their symptoms should be at their worst because they just haven't taken their meds yet. The other lines are essentially after medication. And you can see it separates nicely. But when you look at it on an individual level, it's just so noisy. It's, it's just so erratic that we couldn't separate the groups. And so this is kind of, you know, it's one of those things I wish could, you know, I, I want to be able to separate, but, you know, this is where I need data scientists to help me because I'm not sure there's a, there's a way to do that. But you know, that kind of graph just pulls up my heart. Um, and then this, the last thing I'm going to show you quick. Oh, go ahead. Do you have a baseline sample for every patient? Like, if you were to take one, like, like SAO worst, SAO best, and like a world view, like, what would you it's a, it? Yeah, it was sort of random, meaning we asked for the, the app asked for people to submit samples throughout the day. But it just depended. I mean, so we do we do have that for some people. Like, for the day, like, like they'll they'll label it each time it asks them the question. So for some patients, yeah, we have it before and after, and then some we don't. But if we limit it on that, I think we we lose a lot of people. But yeah, that's actually. Like <laughs> that's what it seems to be. That seems to be the biggest issue. It seems to be a lot of individual variability. And then in my, another question we had was, well, then can we actually detect early, you know, early signs? So can we take the, more, the, the mild symptoms of Parkinson's and show that, hey, could this digital biomarker be used to detect earlier signs? And so I'm just going to uh, kind of jump, jump through this. But again, we took out these audio, Pi audio analysis features, combined with a Geneva feature set I told you about. Um, and here's some severity detection. And here, you know, we were getting through these results I'm showing you with Parkinson's, and I'm thinking, man, that it was one thing to think of, okay, we got good, good scores for the movement data, um, some for the just general classification. But man, with voice, you know, with severity detection, we're getting 93.93 over here with like the gradient boosted area under the curve. You know, it's hard to, and again, I'm thinking, what are we missing? Well, <clears throat> we went back to the data set and we looked and said, hey, Remember, there's a, a lot of people, there's like a, a submitting samples, but there was a few people submitting a ton of samples. So what is that doing to the data, right? So if you look, there's some people, there's a low number of people, uh, so a number of times activities repeated, repeating the activity ton of times. So what's happening is identity confounding. We were worried that we're ending up with the same person in the test and the train set. And so I wanted to redo the analysis separating, meaning you're not going to have the same person in the training or the test set. It's going to be excluded, right? So we went through and we, we organized the data that way so that the algorithm's not basically just learning the individual and saying, oh yeah, I know who that is, and identifying them. That's kind of cheating, right? And here we go. We got a little bit more modest results, but still pretty reasonable for just including the voice biomarker. And if you guys can't see this, so like 0.81 over here for a gradient boosted, over here 0.79 with the variance. But definitely, I mean, it's still re you know promising. But you can see that identity confounder, it was really easy to get excited at first, but 
based on clinical data always having some catches, that was, that was playing a real a big role there. And then I'm just going to jump into Alzheimer's and then we're just about done. Um, <clears throat> so Alzheimer's I'm really excited about because we finally have access to the Framingham Heart Study data and they've been tracking cognitive aging since 2005. And so we have MRI data, blood tests, we have tons of data and they've been recording the neuropsychological testing since 2005. So they have over 9,000 patients with an hour each of recording. So we have voice, we can correlate with MRI, with amyloid, CSF, all kinds of stuff. So super excited about this. We've just started analyzing this. <clears throat> Took well over a year to organize and actually get the data. You know, it's a data set that's owned by NHLBI, one of the National Institutes of Lymphoma, the blood diseases, and so it's, it, was a, it was a big, big target. Um, and you can see, I'm just, I'm just showing out some preliminary results with uh, what the voice samples look like. So for example, I grabbed just to show you guys, so sample one, two, and three, and four. If you guys had to guess, uh, orange is the patient speaking, blue is the interviewer. Guess which one of these has uh, Alzheimer's, if you had to guess. I can't hear you. Okay, why are people saying two? Because they're like really short, really small snippets. So that's interesting. I kind of was thinking, yeah, what's going on? Is this person have Alzheimer's? They did not have it. But again, this is following people over many years. So it's not, not to say they won't have it eventually. <clears throat> but at the time of this recording, this was considered a normal or non-cognitive decline patient based on their scores. But they were just being really quick. They're like, yeah, no. I just, it, I, from listening, I got the sense they just weren't that into it. So it was kind of a confounder. Um, but this one, uh, sample three, has Alzheimer's. So this is somebody, when you ask them a question, it was a lot of, uh, that thing, you know, and then, and I'll show you on this next slide. Um, and what I wanted to show you up here, so long silences, very helpful, right? These are different utterances. And then turn taking. This is a voice activity detector, so we can automatically detect when someone's voice is on. It's really helpful. <clears throat> so again, phoneme rate, silence ratio, all kind of interesting ways to divide. But you can see patient versus control, you can, you can divide based on some of these features, right? And we want to combine a lot of these. So like that patient three, we were sh uh, one of the, this is a one hour of testing. So one of the tasks is the cookie theft picture. Have you guys heard of this? Genevieve, come on, shake your head. Have you heard of this? Yeah. You have it? Okay. All right, because this, this was you when you were a kid, right? Um, so this is the cookie theft picture. It's super famous because it's super old, but we've been using it in, in Parkinson's or uh, <coughs> cognitive testing, I don't know, for decades. Um, but anyways, the point is you show someone this picture and you have them describe it and you take it away, right? And you see, can they remember and, how, and say, describe the picture you saw. And so someone like probably most people in this room, I'm hoping, would be able to recall with pretty good detail. You know, you might say things like, oh yeah, you know, there was a lady washing dishes by the window, the sink was overflowing. Oh, and then the kid was about to fall on the stool, blah, 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 cookie jar. So the person back here, you know, you ask them that question, they're like, oh, yeah, there were some kids and a lady, you know, and they might say a lot of pronouns, they might just use a lot of imprecise um, words, a lot of ahs, ums, but they have a hard time remembering these details. It's that short-term memory, right, and visual encoding. And so I kind of wanted to point out here, <clears throat> this is where that pronoun-noun ratio comes into play. So it turns out with this picture description task, pronoun-noun ratio is really, um, and this was a factor, they just did some factor loadings with this, but this was significant. I mean, a lot of them were significant, but I'm pointing out Honor statistic is a linguistic statistic. It's just showing like lexical complexity. Like are people using you know, a wide vocabulary? So it kind of captured that nicely. So as predicted, that would, that would be helpful. So skewness of the MFCC. <clears throat> Again, uh, people with Alzheimer's, are, that's, that's a significance. Phonation rate. Uh, so people might be talking slower or having longer silences. Uh, oh yeah, and then key words, because again, if you know the context of what you're asking, how many times do people use the word window? Or like use specifics, and people with cognitive decline are using specifics less. Here's a quick word tree of uh, some of the data we have. Go ahead.
Absolutely. The neuropsychologists in the crowd can detect that with ast astutely. So the nice thing is, I mean, neuropsychological testing in general, one of the things that makes it so useful is it can catch a lot of these things. So let's say they're saying things, but it's all inaccurate. Well, if they're using complex language, I mean, I'm a lot less worried about Alzheimer's, right? I might be thinking about other things. Well, are they faking it? Is there, are they, I don't know, something else going on? So as a whole, if we look at all the data, you can try to tease that out. But you're right, I mean, that, that can happen. And you, you have to be able to uh, account for that. So that's the whole point is we have to come up with enough features that can catch those things and not just have a false positive. Exactly, yeah. We have a semantic, so we have that semantic coherence uh, feature. So we grab that, we put that in there. And so part of what I'm trying to do also is not just, okay, can we detect these things? I want to build models of disease from voice in this automated way. So Alzheimer's will have a model, but then schizophrenia will have a different model. And then those are places where it'll, it'll be different. Right now, we've been doing, yeah, mostly binary classifiers or some regressions depending on if we're, if we're tracking a score, like a continuous variable score, or, or you know, continuous as it can be. But um, for the most part, either classification or regression, yeah. I'm trying to move more into modeling the disease itself, too. And then, anyways, just a quick, but again, clinical correlation. And you can imagine, right, when we're doing the neuropsych testing, we ask people, like, you know, s subtract from seven, or, so you see there's a lot of random numbers. So this is um, what the word map looks like uh, from these samples from uh, Alzheimer's, or the cognitive aging study I got. So you have to think to yourself, too, well, why are there certain words? You have to take it into context, right? This isn't free speech. This is in response to certain specific questions. Okay, I think I'm, I've gone over time. And I can talk to people afterwards. But I wanted to thank Dave Atkins, my research mentor, the Behavioral Research and, and Technology and Engineering Center. Rachel, represent. A lot of excitement. <laughs> And then uh, Dong Se is faculty in computer science. So he and his students have been working alongside me with a lot of this data. Cenk is uh, in Turkey, and we've been doing a lot of work with his group as well. His students have been great. And Cenk has had a lot of experience with <coughs> cognitive decline, Alzheimer's type of research, especially with voice. So he's been a great collaborator. And then just thanking my NIH funding, Veterans Hospital, and of course, all the students, they've been very nice to put up with me for a long time now. Thank you for your attention and patience. I'm happy to talk to people more privately afterwards, too, because I know it's 4.30. I don't want to keep everyone too late. Should I end it? <laughs>